Leo San Felice. And it's a great honor for me to, 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 be, to participate to your neuroscience meeting. Uh, this is, a, I think, a, a, an art topic because we will see during uh, this presentation that many physiopathological um, aspects of these uh, uh, changes uh, of brain structure related to seizures events uh, the pathophysiologist of these changes um, is not well understood. Uh, I would like to start with some uh, general uh, uh, concept. Uh, we have seen, you know, the, the epilepsy uh, may induce functional changes in the brain activity. And in, only in some cases, uh, we are, are able to see uh, some changes using uh, uh, both structural uh, or advanced sequences uh, of MR. Uh, and in many cases, in the majority of cases, these changes are reversible, but it's important to consider that most in the most severe condition, these changes may be uh, reversible only partially. Uh, it's important to say that the etiology uh, of seizures uh, and the, of epilepsy and the duration of seizures are, uh, of course, important factors. And it's important to consider that the status epilepticus is probably the condition uh, where these uh, changes are uh, more frequently seen on MR uh, images. There are uh, several um, structures of the brain that are uh, that shows a, a greater vulnerability, in particular the hippocampi or the deep gray matter, the basal ganglia and thalami, but also the white matter may be uh, affected in a special condition. And as I said, uh, there is an open point and probably I have no uh, clear answer uh, regarding this point. Uh, the pathogenesis in many cases remains mostly unknown. In particular, in some cases, we are not to understand if the these changes uh, is a manifest are the manifestations of the etiology of seizure uh, or if they are an effect of seizure. I think that to better understand these uh, uh, physiopathological processes, it's important to, uh, to get a step back to understand and to see uh, which is the environment where the neurons work. In particular, I would like to, dis to discuss about the neurovascular unit that basically describes the liaison, uh, this is a sort of structural and functional liaison um, between the endothelium, the white matter cells, the vasculature of the brain and the neurons. Um, we know, you know that the, to have neurons that works properly, it's important that the integrity of the white matter, in particular, the astrocytes and the microglial cells plays a key role in mediating the activity of neurons. And of course, it's absolutely important also to have uh, an integrity of the vascular uh, unit uh, uh, of the brain. In particular, it plays an important role, the blood brain barrier and all cells which are located within the basement membrane, in particular, the parasites. It is important to underline that within the neurovascular unit, we have uh, several uh, um, uh, immune uh, cells with an immune function, such as the microglial cells or the perivascular macrophage, which plays an important role in uh, uh, the uh, seizures and uh, epilepsy-related events. In fact, what we know uh, is that uh, in many cases of uh, seizures, we may observe some changes which can be related to uh, the loss of function of uh, and integrity of the blood-brain barrier. We may observe an abnormal activation of the immune cells with, a, with a, a cytosis or activation of microglial. And of course, altogether, these changes may uh, justify some findings that we observe on MR images acquired in the uh, early post-ictal stage. These slides basically summarize all the processes that uh, I will discuss in the future slides. And I think it's important to consider that uh, we, um, of course, uh, are, it's important to uh, analyze the processes regarding the gray matter, but it's important also to analyze the role of the wet matter and the uh, brain vasculature in the processes related to the seizures. Uh, let's start from the neurovascular coupling. 
uh, it is a physiological process that basically uh, uh, aims to oversupply oxygenated blood in the region of the brain, which are more uh, activated. It can be considered like a sort of functional hyperemia, and uh, for this, uh, it is a, a really important process. When we move this concept uh, in the field of epilepsy uh, during a, a seizure, uh, we may uh, use this, this, uh, this coupling between the metabolic activity of the neurons and the vasculature activity, reactivity, uh, looking at the perfusion images. In fact, uh, in the early stages uh, during the ictal states, of course, the duration and the magnitude are absolutely important uh, in order to define the entity of the uh, vasculature reaction. But during the early stages of ictal stage, we can observe uh, a quick uh, increase of the blood flow in the region of the brain, in the neck or region of the brain involved in the seizures. And it, is, can, it, it can be considered like a sort of com, uh, compensatory uh, hyperperfusion. In some cases, which are the, characterized by a longer duration of seizure and an increased ma and a higher magnitude of the seizure, uh, we may also, this hyperperfusion could be uh, no longer sufficient to uh, meet the metabolic demand of the cerebral cortex. And in that cases, we may also observe the restriction of diffusion. So I will show you some cases. This is the case of a, a young girl, 11 years old, presenting at emergency room with the first seizure, uh, right frontal AAG abnormalities. Uh, this is a peculiar case because we, we cannot see any abnormalities on flare, no abnormalities on uh, uh, DWI, but perfusion image localized an hyperperfusion in the right frontal lobe. And these abnormalities are reversible are always reversible. Perfusion changes related to seizure are in any case reversible and are no longer visible when uh, we uh, perform a follow-up in, in the iterical states. In a more severe epilepsy, uh, like this case of an infant with uh, um, a left hemimegalencephaly, uh, you can see this left occipital pole with uh, an important malformation of the cortex uh, uh, showing uh, in, uh, of course, this, uh, this infant uh, presenting uh, uh, a severe uh, seizure uh, and relapsing seizure, uh, an increased perfusion on ASL map, but also a restriction of diffusion of the cerebral cortex in the same region, presenting the hyperperfusion. Another important concept is that this uh, increase of perfusion persist longer compared to the diffusion restriction uh, uh, into the brain. Uh, and this is an important point because uh, if you are not able to, to perform a MAR scan uh, in the child immediately uh, after the, the seizure, uh, you probably have uh, sometimes, probably 24 hours or 48 hours to uh, complete the examination and the perfusion study should be uh, introduced in the protocol because it may provide useful information for localizing the epileptogenic zone. Uh, this is an example. Uh, it is a sort of longitudinal analysis uh, to evaluate what happened on uh, uh, DWI and the perfusion images in children with focal epilepsy. Uh, she was a girl with a left focal epilepsy. It was an encephalitis, viral encephalitis. You can see this uh, focal involvement of the left frontal region, which was characterized by the restriction of diffusion associated to the increase of perfusion uh, in the same regions. Uh, these are the images acquired in the, at the moment uh, she arrived in the emergency room. After 24 hours, we observe a sort of normalization uh, of DWI images, but the perfusion persists increase in the uh, affected region. And the last row shows the images of the late follow-up presenting the resolution of both abnormalities. Another important uh, process that has been hypothesized to be involved in the abnormalities that we observe after a seizure is the excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity is a process related to the accumulation of the glutamate in the extracellular space. 
And we know that this neurotransmitter is able to activate and open the ion, channel, uh, ion channels uh, on the membrane of the cells of the brain, leading to a calcium inflow into these cells. And uh, uh, this, um, this process, uh, of course, leads to a sort of uh, uh, osmotic effect and determining the swelling of these cells. And we can use the diffusion weight image to see the restriction of diffusion in the affected region of the gray matter, revealing um, is a sort of uh, is a, uh, related to a reduction of the extracellular space that reduces the diffusivity of water in the extracellular space. To complete this analysis and characterize, better characterize this condition, in particular to differentiate, for example, um, this condition from the ischemic lesion of the cortex, you may you probably can use also advanced sequences uh, such as the spectroscopy. Uh, if you if you perform a, a single voxel acquisition within the lesion using a short echo time, you can see also the peak at the level of 2.2, uh, indicating the increased level of GLX complex, indicating the accumulation of glutamate and glutamine in that region. Uh, the seizure related excessivity uh, uh, is more frequent in specific region of the brain, and of course, hippocampal regions are more frequently involved. Uh, here you can see the typical pattern on MRI images. You can see the swelling of the hippocampal regions uh, with the T2 hyperintensity of both structures. And it's important to look at DWI images because this is a, the typical finding. This line of restriction of diffusion in the superficial portion of the hippocampus, uh, uh, involving in many cases both the head of the hippocampus but also the tail of the hippocampus. And this condition is uh, absolutely more frequent in the status epileticus, but in some cases of um, uh, infection or uh, encephalitis or in. Uh, uh, seizure related uh, uh, of seizure related to the autoimmune disease can also be seen. The reasons of this uh, greater susceptibility of a hippocampal region to the excitotoxicity seems to be related to uh, an increased expression of these uh, uh, channels in the membrane of cells. Uh, of the hippocampus, in particular, the increased expression of NMDA receptor subunits uh, allow any, an higher inflow of calcium within the cells. And of course, it leads to a sort of a, uh, enlargement of swelling of these cells, but it may affect also the metabolic function of the mitochondria within the cells and in the uh, most severe seizures and in the forms of uh, uh, relapsing seizures, we, we may also have the apoptosis of these cells. And this, this could also justify uh, the presence of the uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, the hippocampal sclerosis in the later stages of disease. I think it's important to say that the hippocampal sclerosis is relatively rare in the pediatric population. It's much more frequent in adults. But in children with a severe form of epilepsy and uh, sometimes with the forms of uh, relapsing seizures uh, or with status epilepticus, uh, we, we can also observe uh, this finding also in children in the pediatric population. Uh, another important concept is that the, these two mechanisms, the abnormalities, the neurovascular coupling and the excitotoxicity in many cases are closed, are uh, linked. Uh, in fact, uh, it's possible that to see uh, changes on DWI sequences, uh, which are considered related to a mechanism of excitotoxicity, and in the same region of the brain, we may also have the hyperperfusion, of course, during the post-ictal or early post-ictal stage uh, of the seizure. Another region that could be uh, involved uh, and ca frequently characterized by changes uh, after seizure is the cerebral cortex. Uh, this is a case of a, a nine-year-old boy presenting with a focal uh, uh, seizure um, with a AG abnormality in the right parietal region. Uh, these are the images of MR performed uh, in, in the few hours after we arrived at the emergency room, we found this region of the swelling of the cerebral cortex with the flare hyperintensity 
associated to these uh, small uh, lesions in the subcortical wet matter in this region. Uh, there was no significant restriction of this fusion, while the perfusion image shows a focal area of hyperperfusion. So uh, this case uh, on these images, and the first examination uh, was suspected to be a tumor of the cerebral cortex. Uh, we, at the moment, we were not able to define which kind of tumor. So we decided to perform a short follow-up, and these are the images after six months. Uh, no uh, seizure at the moment of examination, the period of this examination. And you can see that the uh, swelling of the cerebral cortex uh, was no longer visible, uh, remains the lesion in the subcortical portion of the wet matter. The perfusion weighted image was completely changed. Now we see a focal region of hyperperfusion. And I think that another interesting finding in the same patient was observed in the later follow-up after six months. Uh, we were in a periectal period, uh, and you can see again, hyperintensity and swelling of the cerebral cortex, the lesion, the subcortical lesion that then was operated, it was a multivacuolated neurogribrona tumor. Um, and it, it was probably the etiology of the epilepsy. Um, remains stable, this lesion, and again, the perfusion changes appears. So it seems that these changes uh, related to uh, the cortical swelling and uh, uh, the perfusion, related perfusion abnormalities can uh, relapse according to the seizure events. Uh, other region which can be involved uh, after seizure by abnormalities uh, uh, are the deep gray matter, in particular, the medial and posterior portion of the thalamus, the pulmonary nuclei, and uh, but also the basal ganglia can be uh, 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 may show some abnormalities after seizures. And um, the reasons of the these abnormalities, the connection between the uh, seizure that mainly involved the cerebral cortex and the involvement of deep gray matter. Uh, of course, it remains an open point, but it seems to be a strong correlation uh, with the duration of seizure. More longer seizure uh, more frequently shows these abnormalities involving also the deeper gray matter. And of course, in the status epileptic, these findings are absolutely more frequent. Uh, but the reason seems to be related to uh, the very strong connections of this deep gray matter nuclei with the cerebral cortex. For example, the pulmonar of Ptolemy uh, presenting a sort of um, specific connection with different regions of the brain, and we may find uh, the, the abnormalities on FLIR and on DWI in the different portion of the pulmonar according to the lesion of the region of the cerebral cortex involved in the seizure. For example, the medial portion of the pulmonar shows um, more connect connection with the um, stronger connection with the temporal and frontal region of the cortex, the lateral pulmonar with the parietal lobe, while the inferior portion of the pulmonar with the occipital region of the cortex. And the similar concept can be applied also to justify the involvement of the uh, basal ganglia. Again, we know that there are several uh, uh, connections, strong connections between these nuclei and the cerebral cortex. And again, we can also uh, try to uh, define using an eye resolution imaging uh, the distribution of abnormality within the basal ganglia and the site of the uh, lesion in the cortex or the EG abnormalities within the cortex. Um, when we speak about the basal ganglia rule in the epilepsy, it's also important to, to uh, remember that these structures play an important role in the, as an inhibitory uh, control system of the epileptic activity of the cerebral cortex. And of course, it uh, uh, justifies also the strong connections between this deep uh, gray matter structure and then the cerebral cortex. And of course, uh, seems to be also um, plays a role in the inhibition of it, uh, and the presence, uh, sometimes the presence of lesions involving these uh, deep gray matter structures may also lead to a sort of disinhibition of the cerebral cortex leading to seizure activities. 
Most recently has been demonstrated the role of the blood-brain barrier in epilepsy. In particular, now we know that the dysfunction of the blood-brain barrier uh, can contribute to the epileptogenesis and uh, in a subject with a already established epilepsy, uh, events that may lead to uh, damage of the barrier may uh, create a worsening of the seizures and uh, epilepsy. Uh, we know that there is a sort of correlation between the disruption, the entity of disruption of the barrier and the uh, activity, the seizure activities. And the mechanism that link the abnormalities of the barrier and the seizure activities is related to the important role of this barrier in keeping the environment uh, that allow the neurons to work uh, properly. In particular, when we have lesions of the, of the barrier, many molecules that we usually observe in the, within the vessels passes into the extracellular space and in many cases, they uh, activate, in particular, inflammatory cells, such as the microglial cells or the perivascular macrophages uh, that produce infl pro-inflammatory molecules that changes the environment uh, within around the neurons. And the neurons, in these cases, may uh, reduce the threshold for epilepsy and start to uh, present seizures. Uh, coming back to the neuroimaging, we have an important tool that we can use for evaluating the integrity of the blood-brain um, uh, barrier, uh, and uh, in particular, the injection of the gadolinium. Uh, these are um, images taken from the literature in patients with uh, operated brain tumors, uh, and during the follow-up, they uh, presented seizures events. And you can see the MR images acquired, these are all T1-weighted image, post-contrast uh, T1-weighted images acquired in the periictal period, showing in all cases uh, focal area of enhancement, corticopial enhancement. And you can see uh, also the uh, early follow-up after three months. Of course, at the first image, uh, the finding, this finding uh, creates some uh, diagnostic challenge uh, in the interpretation of this uh, enhancement, uh, like a sort of pseudo progression or real uh, progression of the oncologic disease. But in all cases, you can see uh, after three months the complete resolution of the enhancement. So it seems that in patients, uh, in this group of patients, we observe enhancement early in the early period after the seizure. And in the early follow-up, we found uh, the complete resolution of this damage of the barrier. And in some cases, this enhancement can also uh, appear relapse after many years. You can see, for example, the first patients, this is uh, on uh, uh, this focal cortical enhancement in the periictal period, complete resolution after a few months. And after five years, new seizure event, again, the contrast enhancement in a similar region of the brain, and again, after a few months, the resolution. So uh, it's, it's it, it, this process of brain barrier disruption seems to have a sort of a, a relapsing uh, course uh, that is very similar to what we see in perfusion images. This is an, an interesting study that has been published a few years ago uh, that basically analyzed in the animal model what happened to the blood-brain barrier uh, uh, during the status epilepticus. And they basically confirmed that the contrast enhancement uh, was significantly higher in the animals uh, with epilepsy compared with the controls. But they also analyzed the, um, the, 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 the histology of the region that they affected the region. And they basically confirmed uh, the loss of integrity of the barrier in uh, epileptic uh, rats, uh, while uh, in the controls, uh, the barrier was completely normal. And uh, an additional important finding was that they basically demonstrate that when we have a uh, disruption of the blood-brain barrier, we also have an increased production of molecules uh, related to an inflammation of that region. So the next mechanism that has been hypothesized to have a role in epilepsy is the neuroinflammation. Uh, the neuroinflammation is the process of inflammation that involves uh, the brain tissues, and uh, there are many mechanisms that may uh, activate these processes. 
some of them are congenital, other can be acquired, such as ischemic lesions or a brain trauma. But uh, using a different mechanism, all these processes activate the inflammatory cells within the brain tissues, microglial cells and astrocytes. And we know that these activated cells may produce molecules such as the cytokines, chemokines, or pro-inflammatory factors that in some way may enhance the inflammation of the brain in specific region. And uh, it's been demonstrated the correlation between the seizures event and the presence of inflammation. In particular, we know that the presence of neuroinflammation creates a sort of vicious cycle because the neuroinflammation uh, induces the neurons to uh, have an abnormal function and to lead to seizures event. Excitotoxicity could be hypothesized to be a sort of consequence of the epilepsy, uh, enhance the, the damage of the blood-brain barrier. And we have seen that there is a link between the blood-brain barrier damage and the presence of inflammation. So it enhances again, the epilepsy. So it seems that the, uh, the, the analysis of all these processes and the combinations of all these processes uh, set the basis for um, a relapsing seizures and uh, intractable seizures. In this sense, we also analyzed the group of subjects uh, with focal cortical dysplasia, and they basically analyzed the presence, the presence of inflammatory cells in the uh, epileptogenic region that were operated, uh, that were operated, and they basically demonstrated a positive correlation between the concentration of inflammatory cells and the frequency of seizures uh, in these patients. Uh, very recently has been published also uh, some important imaging studies. Uh, uh, now we have some tools that basically we can use to describe the inflammation in the brain tissues. In particular, we can use uh, this uh, a tracer um, to obtain PET image. Uh, this is called DPA713, uh, which is considered a marker of microglial activation. And in this study, this tracer has been used to characterize uh, the uh, lesions in a group of children with epilepsy due to the brain malformations. For example, uh, here you can see um, a very large area of polymicrogeria, and you can see a comparison of the typical FDG pet that is commonly used also in children with focal epilepsy, showing a region of lower assumed values in the posterior portion of this area of polymicrogeria. And you can see uh, the path acquired using the tracer or microglial activation, indicating the presence of inflammation in the uh, old portion of the malformation of the polymicrogeria area. Uh, similar findings were also observed in this case of tuberous sclerosis. Uh, in the frontal opercular region, there was a cortical tubers, and in the same region, you can see a focal activation of microglial cells uh, represented by uh, the PET image. There are also, the neuroinflammation, of course, plays an important role. It seems to be a decay uh, physiopathological mechanism in some syndromes characterized by severe epilepsy uh, related to febrile events. Uh, and of course, the virus, the febrile infection related epilepsy syndrome is uh, probably the most, uh, um, the most famous uh, syndrome with this characteristic, with these characteristics. This is a review published from your group. And uh, so you know very well uh, this paper. And um, of course, this is a rare severe epileptic syndrome occurring in the, in the previous LT children. And it is characterized by uh, these refractory status of uh, epilepticus following a febrile illness. These are images studies in your hospital, so I would like to thank Felice for allowing to, to show uh, this imaging. And you can see the involvement um, of the temporal lobes in the cortex of the temporal lobe, typical involvement of the insular portion and the basal ganglia. Again, in patients with the severe seizures, you can see this typical finding in the superficial portion of the hippocampus in the acute stage. And it's important to consider that uh, when you have the possibility to uh, acquire follow-up images, the, the brain atrophy is a, a common finding also in this case. 
Another condition, uh, epileptic syndrome uh, associated with the fever is the hemiconvulsion hemiplegia epilepsy syndrome. Uh, this syndrome is more frequent in children with a known epileptogenic lesion, for example, focal cortical dysplasia. And uh, in this patient, the uh, seizure, the status epilepticus is triggered by the presence of uh, an infection events, for in many cases, a sort of viral infections uh, leading to fever. And here you can see uh, what happened to the hemisphere where uh, the epileptogenic lesion is present. In this case, it was a focal cortical dysplasia type 3D. You can see in the acute stage, the swelling of the cortex and the restriction of diffusion, while in the chronic stage, you can see the atrophy of this hemisphere and um, the, the lower values of perfusion in the same hemisphere in the chronic stage. So it seems seem, uh, the, the, near, the near inflammation seems to have uh, an, a key role in uh, this condition, um, like in the virus. Another important concept that I think it's important to underline is that the uh, seizure-related changes in some cases affect also the white matter. And the transient splenial lesions are probably the most frequent involvement in uh, uh, seizure-related changes of the white matter. Uh, here you can see the typical finding, the hyperintensity on T2 uh, weighted sequences um, of the splenium of the corporal callosal. Sometimes you can see also the restriction of diffusion in the same region. It's important to say that yes, it is a, a really frequent finding, but at the same time, it is a low. It has a low specificity for epilepsy because it, this finding can can be seen also in other patients with other disease, uh, which are not closely related to epilepsy. Another frequent uh, finding in uh, the white involving the white matter in uh, children with uh, a severe epilepsy is the so-called early myelination. Uh, these are images of a uh, acquired at four months of age in a child with a malformation of the uh, right frontal lobe. And you can see this typical uh, uh, finding um, that you can see on T2-weighted image, the low signal of cortex and subcortical wet matter in the region where the lesion is uh, present. Then you can see after several months that this uh, finding is no longer visible on the uh, T2-weighted sequences. And uh, I think it's important to try to understand, I would like to, to explain this process, presenting this very recent uh, paper um, that basically demonstrate a correlation between the uh, neuronal activity and uh, the degree of myelination. In particular, in this study on the animal models, uh, the authors demonstrated that the uh, activity of neurons uh, uh, leads to uh, regulate the myelination. And when we have an aberrant patterns of neuronal activity, such as in patients with a, uh, an early onset epilepsy, uh, this condition may induce a sort of proliferation of oligodendrocytes and uh, improve and uh, stimulate the myelination. Uh, here you can see also the images uh, of the corpus callosum of rats. Uh, with a uh, epileptic mutation and controls, you can see that before the seizure onset, the number of oligodendrocytes and the degree of myelination around the axons uh, were comparable before the seizure onset. But after the uh, seizure onset, you can see the greater myelination in the group of rats with the epileptic mutation compared with control. So it seems that the neuronal activity uh, leads the myelination in uh, uh, in this uh, in specific region of the brain involved in the network of seizures. Of course, there are also other conditions, uh, uh, more severe, unfortunately, more rare condition where we have a, a more severe involvement of the white matter uh, after seizure. Uh, these conditions were classified as acute leg encephalopathy uh, with restricted diffusion. And according to the neuroradiological pattern of restriction of diffusion, they uh, can be classified into two main groups. Those with diffuse acute leg encephalopathy, and this is a rapid and severe deterioration. It is characterized by a rapid and severe deterioration of consciousness, and it is a most severe um, uh, condition. 
And the second one is the central sparing acute leg encephalopathy with restricted diffusion. She's characterized by a biphasic clinical course, and it, is, and it is also known as the acute encephalopathy with biphasic seizures and the late reduced diffusion. This is a case with a girl, uh, that we studied several years ago in our hospital with the central sparing um, uh, acute uh, encephalopathy. And you can see that on the first row, the MAR images acquired the mission of patient at emergency room. Uh, the patient presented with seizures, but with a, uh, with a quick recovery of consciousness during this acute period. Uh, you can see on MR images, these are diffusion images and FLIR images, this restriction of diffusion in the subcortical white matter in uh, many regions of the brain. And uh, after four days, we have a worsening of the clinical um, scenario in the same patient with the clustering seizures. We performed again the MR scan, and you can see the worsening of findings on the same sequences. Uh, in particular, on DWI sequences, we found this restriction of diffusion in subcortical wet matter, but with the sparing of the uh, central portion of the brain. And in this case, we have also the images of the follow-up uh, after 10 years showing the atrophy of many regions of the brain. This is another case that you study in your hospital. Uh, and uh, this is a case of diffuse acute encephalopathy restricted diffusion. Uh, you can see on diffusion with images, the same finding, restriction of diffusion of subcortical white matter with the typical bright three appearance. Uh, in this case, uh, all the white matter was involved. Uh, it was a, a, a Dravet syndrome. And uh, I think that all these really severe cases uh, creates two open point, two questions. The first is, uh, which is the, the pathogenesis of this uh, severe white matter involvement? And uh, uh, there are several papers discussing uh, this process. And also in this case, on the animal model with the same kind of mutation, the mutation in the same gene, epileptogenic gene, uh, has been demonstrated an important activation of inflammatory cells in the white matter. So it's possible to hypothesize that the neuroinflammation again plays an important role in the uh, changes in the white matter. But the second question is how we have to interpret the restriction of diffusion in the white matter. So we, we have to consider it like a sort of exotoxicity, or is it a sort of uh, intramyelinic edema or is it acute degeneration of the white matter? A possible explanation has been proposed by the theory of the potassium siphoning uh, to this question. For its action potential, uh, we know that we need to have the sodium inflow that occurs at the level of non-myelinated portion of the axon, at the level of the Ramvier node, and the potassium needs to go out. The, the outflow of the potassium that occurs at the level of the axon covered by the myelin. So the potassium needs to move through the myelin sheets uh, using the ion channels and uh, to arrive into the astrocytes and then to reach uh, the vessels. So an important concept is that for each cations of potassium, uh, a greater number of molecules of water needs to move out from the intracellular to into the extracellular space. And uh, now try to imagine what happened during an intense and uh, uh, intense seizure. We have the potassium moving out of the outflow of potassium and uh, uh, passing through these sheets of myelin to arrive into the astrocytes and reach the vessels. So during a seizure, probably this process is overload. So it may lead to the accumulation of water and potassium within the sheets of the myelin. And it may determine the formation of vacuoles within the myelin sheets. So, uh, you know, this is a process that in many cases may lead to uh, the intramyelinic edema that we can see as a restriction of diffusion uh, of uh, the white matter. But of course, it is, uh, it is only an hypothesis that may, we may consider to justify this restriction of diffusion of the white matter. So I'm in conclusion, and I think uh, that 
I have no definitive answer to all the doubts related to the mechanisms that may arise about the nature of the alterations uh, that we have seen in this presentation. Uh, I think that uh, as this exists uh, um, a clear uh, point, we have a, a, a temporal relationship between the occurrence of this alteration and the presence of epileptic seizures. We have seen some cases uh, where the, the seizure-related changes relapse according to the seizure events. So I think that there is a sort of relationship. Of course, uh, we are not sure if these um, changes are closely related, are the effect, are related to the seizure activity, but of course we, have, we can consider also uh, that um, some possible explanation to these processes considering not only the gray matter activity, but considering also the white matter, uh, the loss of white matter integrity, and also the dysfunction of uh, the blood brain barrier. And I think that also the processes of the ion and water homeostasis should be considering among the mechanisms that can be uh, analyzed for uh, justifying uh, these processes. Thank you very much for your attention. Amazing talk once again, Domenico, and you covered everything. Um, I can see there are some um, questions. Uh, Christine Alze, one of the epileptologists here, let me also allow you to talk as well, Christine, if you want to ask, could ASL be used to identify epileptic tubers in TS for patients considered for epilepsy surgery? Uh, we have we have experience uh, in this in this field. Uh, we have seen that when you have a subject with the tuberous sclerosis uh, and uh, you have the possibility to 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 acquire the MAR images in the early past ictal stages, uh, we have seen the hyperperfusion related to uh, the tuberous, which is more active. Uh, and uh, it correlates with also with the EEG abnormalities. So the, my answer is yes. But it's important to acquire um, ASL images uh, early after the seizure. Thank you very much. You would reckon you would need to, to acquire it within 24, 48 hours? Yes, I, I think uh, there is no, no rules. So uh, uh, there are no studies defining a specific time. But in our experience, we have seen that the first two days uh, represents the optimum for the period of the hyperperfusion following the seizures. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Job. You're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry, I was muted. Michael Young, a colleague from Real London. Michael, yeah. go ahead. Hi, hi, Dominica. Yeah, thank you for that interesting interview. I think this was related to, to what you just answered, maybe, but do we have a feel for the time course of some of these changes post? Um, post-seizure, particularly the, the ASL and the diffusion-weighted uh, changes? Um, yes, yes, thank you for your question. Uh, the, I think that the, quiz, the, the, the first changes uh, is related to the perfusion abnormalities. Mm. So, the, and, and it's, I think it's obvious because we have the neurovascular coupling, which is a physiological process occurring uh, uh, as a sort of a, a compensation, quick compensation of the intense activity of the cortex. So uh, we have to expect first the hyperperfusion. And in many cases, we, we, we are not able to see any abnormalities on DWI sequences, in particular, when you have a very uh, quick or short seizure event. Uh, DWI abnormalities are more frequent when you have a very long seizure or a relapsing seizure or uh, in the status of epilepticus. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Suresh, go ahead and then I will uh, ask the questions, the, some other questions okay. on the Q&A. Thank you, Domenico. That was an excellent summary of uh, all the literature. I think that was very, very helpful to have that. Uh, just a, a question and then a couple of comments. <laughs> So with regards to the, the perfusion uh, imaging, uh, you said, I mean, do we know uh, what is the cutoff is, or some idea as to how long does the seizure have to be uh, to see persistent kind of perfusion changes long, lasting longer than hours? So I'm just look, looking at, I'm thinking of uh, 
what could be the practical implication. We, we used to do SPECT uh, imaging uh, for our epilepsy surgery patients. And uh, uh, if we do kind of see consistent perfusion changes and whether there is any role of uh, doing uh, immediate post-ictal imaging to kind of try and see whether that would give any useful information. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think that probably when you acquire your SPEC images, you are able to uh, have a monitor of the EEG activity during the acquisition. And probably is a, 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 an important advantage in defining the, uh, the, the, the perfusion changes because you are uh, demonstrating the presence of uh, epileptic abnormalities uh, at the EEG uh, map. When we acquire ASL images, in many cases, are not um, sure what's happening in uh, at, uh, in the brain into the brain. So we are not sure if there is a, a seizure, if we are in a in a late postictal or early postictal event. So it's uh, much more complicated to uh, be sure about uh, the interpretation of the perfusion abnormalities on MR perfusion techniques, not only alternative spell labeling, but also gadolinium related perfusion techniques. Uh, we, we, we have no cutoff, so uh, we are not able to define a limit, um, a value of perfusion that we can, we can, com we can consider abnormal or uh, again normal. But I know that we can have a sort of semi-quantitative voxel-based analysis of the cortex and compare, for example, the two hemispheres for a sort of intra-subject intra analysis and define the region with the higher values of ASL, or, uh, or we can compare uh, these values with the sort of normative data that we collected uh, using the same sequence uh, and the same scanner in other children without epilepsy. So, uh, there are several uh, semi-quantitative approach, but not a, a real quantitative. We, we never use uh, ROI to define a value, uh, to define if the values of ASL within the cortex is normal or abnormal, because we have no reference about this process. Thank you. Uh, Maris, is it okay? Shall, or shall we let someone else kind of ask and then we can come, I can come back. Uh, if you have important comments to make, yeah. let us make so, them. Just, uh, I'm very relieved, uh, Dominica, you said that it's very difficult to be sure uh, how much of it is seizure, how much of it is the reason why they had the seizure in the first place, isn't it? It's, it's uh, almost impossible to separate those two. And uh, most of the examples you showed were the, the patients who had a lesion. Uh, they were, there was some kind of a clear, whether it was encephalitis or uh, FCD, there was some kind of uh, a lesion and uh, the changes that you, we saw were on top of that. So we we spent many years, uh, Michael is there on the call as well, and uh, Rod uh, Scott, who did the initial kind of study. So we had a, a large cohort of patients with prolonged febrile seizures, uh, no abnormal neurology, uh, who have had at least 30 minutes of seizures. And, uh, Rod had initially done like uh, within 48 to 72 hours uh, scanning to kind of see what were the changes. And then Michael did a, a couple of years later, and then uh, I did uh, about eight years after uh, to see whether the, what we found basically was that uh, in the immediate kind of uh, post status state, there was uh, diffusion changes to kind of suggest vasogenic edema uh, around the, within the first 40 to, 48 to 72 hours that to seem to kind of resolve within five to seven days after they had status. And uh, Michael's kind of data didn't kind of, so we are, we are particularly interested in the prolonged febrile seizure group to kind of see whether the status itself led to a, the, the big kind of uh, uh, hypothesis we wanted to test was the MTS uh, following prolonged febrile seizure kind of a hypothesis. And uh, uh, Michael, I, I don't think Michael found anyone with uh, within the first couple of years to have MTS. and. Uh, in within my cohort of 35 children who had prolonged febrile seizure, only one of them had MTS kind of eight years down the line. So I think I, I my feeling is yes, clearly there there are kind of transient temporary changes following seizures. We know that from 
SPECT studies, from perfusion studies, that we see that whether it leads to any like long term changes, uh, I'm not kind of convinced as yet whether that results in any long term changes. Uh, I don't know whether you found any data to kind of suggest that patients who are having repeated seizures or difficult to control epilepsy have long term changes that could we could directly attribute to seizures. I'm I have not seen data that kind of conclusively suggest that is the case. And likewise, in, in Drave patients, I mean, we we see lots of children with Drave who present with episodes of status epilepticus. And the, the scan that you showed, I mean, there are very few who have rare, it's relatively rare that they have that. And uh, even in those, uh, the incidence of uh, uh, the uh, MTS is quite low, uh, although they tend to have episodes of status more than 30 minutes, one hour. So at least, I, I mean, that's the, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are changes. I mean, and it's clearly helpful to see that on the MRI, but I'm not convinced that CHS themselves are resulting in long-term damage. Okay, interesting. I don't know what, what others think. Michael, do you want to comment? And also, Suresh, you didn't say the percentage in which you found changes in after the status, because you didn't found cha find changes in all of them, isn't it? What no, no, it's Oh, uh, in, in Rod's cohort, I think it was about 15 percent, 14 or 15 percent. Yeah, yeah. Mikey? I think similarly, I didn't find any. I was imaging sort of between two days and uh, up to two weeks um, and didn't really find any changes. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would agree with, I think, what Dominique mentioned, that it's it may occur, but it's definitely in a minority. Um, and as you say, I'm not aware of any good quality evidence which sort of put has a direct you know has a direct chain of evidence um between uh, Naila has a question as well which you might also want to comment as well Naila yes thank you uh, I'm really sorry my camera doesn't work uh, so Dominica thank you very much for this brilliant summary my question is um, probably um somehow related to Suresh's uh, comment in a way and I would like to ask you whether in your experience you've seen bilateral hippocampal sclerosis in children without seizures. Because um, I have at least three, four patients with bilateral hippocampal sclerosis but with no history of status epilepticus or prolonged seizures or frequent seizures. And their seizure semiology is not related to the hippocampal sclerosis. So interesting, isn't it? So I just wanted to know whether this uh, sclerosis was as a result of a different process, but not as a result of the seizures. Yes, thank you for your question. Is uh, uh, we have no no cases of temporal mesial sclerosis without uh, severe epilepsy, and uh, in uh, in the majority of cases of our pediatric temporal mesial sclerosis. We have uh, syndromic epilepsy or uh, encephalitis, severe autoimmune encephalitis uh, or um, status epileptus in, in the history. So uh, there is a sort of um, a relation between the intense seizure activity and uh, the, uh, the developing, uh, the loss of volume of the hippocampus uh, also at the longitudinal analysis of the uh, MRI scan. So uh, uh, I know from the literature that there are several um, important open points uh, relating to the mechanism determining the, the temporal mesial sclerosis, because uh, again, we are not sure if the, it is the effect of the epilepsy or if it is the, 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 the etiology of the epilepsy or both, probably both, because it creates a sort of circle, vicious circle, uh, which uh, enhance and uh, increase the, the, the frequency of seizures. So uh, it, it, it is an interesting uh, field and an interesting question, but I, I have no, uh, no, no uh, clear um, answer to, 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 to give you because it's not easy. Suresh and Michael, do you want to say what you found in your study? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of mention, so uh, obviously it's a biased uh, uh, sample that we had because these were the patients who already had episodes of status. Uh, the one interesting patient in my study was uh, a girl who had 
status with the pneumococcal meningitis when they were uh, one year old. And I think the seizure was about 60 minutes from my memory. And uh, they had just one episode of status and nothing else and completely normal when I followed them up eight years down the line. And on MRI, they had unilateral hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, no seizures for the past like eight years um, and otherwise completely normal child with radiological evidence of uh, mesial temporal sclerosis. So uh, yeah, it's, but there was, they were preterm, uh, they were born preterm. So the risk factors in them was born preterm and they had many pneumococcal meningitis. Yeah. Um, Michael? Yeah, I might just add that, I mean, I think um, uh, mid temporal sclerosis is a very, it's, it's a vanishingly rare sort of incidental finding on, uh, on MR studies. I think everyone would agree with that. Um, but there is an interesting, there is a Japanese study which looks specifically at rel first degree relatives of patients with temporal uh, lobe epilepsy and found that a number of them seemed to have incidental hippocampal sclerosis with no history of seizures. Um, so, so, so suggesting that there may be some, that, that there may be people out there. Um, Michael, would it be possible for you to share this article with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't probably can't get hold of it now, but I'll look it up and maybe I'll, I'll send it to Marios um, or, or to you uh, as well. I think, Thank you. So, so rest, just to be clear, Michael, you never had any control patients without any history of status who also had the uh, incidental no. MTS? No. No, no they, they, I mean, it's, it's very rare. Uh, yeah. I think you need to have a large number. So if you look at uh, studies that have been done for uh, headaches, for example, then you kind of see uh, occasional kind of reports of uh, patients with um, incidental finding of hippocampal sclerosis, but you need to have numbers in the yeah. 1900s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I mean, don't forget, we should not forget also Farhan has Farhan has study who, who has uh, studied these patients with history of HIE in early infancy, but not severe HIE, and then they can be looking like normal children, but they have bilateral hippocampal changes, it can be more visible as an atrophy of the hippocampus rather than sclerosis per se, and they have what Farhan calls developmental amnesia. Um, we can share that paper as well, or there's several papers, more than one. Um, I don't know if, if Torsten is on the on the meeting if he wants to make a comment, I cannot see him. Anyway, um, Michael, did you want to make a comment or is that a legacy hand? Legacy. Hand. Okay. Um, there were some questions about asking about uh, both uh, Das and Marco Peruli were asking about why specifically in SCN1A. I think you tried to answer that question. Maybe we shouldn't reiterate that. I don't think anyone knows. Is that correct? Although you tried to answer the question, Domenico, in your talk. Um, uh, das is also asking about if you see similar changes in generalized seizures. Um, if you have seen, if you see changes in generalized seizures, which the, not not so frequent. Generally, we generally not see. We are not able to see on perfusion images. Yes, is it the question? Um, I suspect so, or or this or restricted diffusion or restricted or diffusion. Sort of, yeah. Only the restriction diffusion generally and perfusion changes in generalized seizure only when we have a very long seizure, but not in the short seizures. And then a colleague uh, is also asking, uh, I think it's uh, from Birmingham, a colleague who is asking if, if uh, how long the seizure needs to be to pick up abnormalities in the ASL. I mean, this will give me the opportunity just to ask you also clarification from your previous talk, because I remember you had presented a case where on the very, very acute periictal phase, like before two hours from the seizure, you said that you may even see hypoperfusion, low perfusion, yes. and then you start seeing hyperperfusion. Do you yes. want to comment on that? And also if you have, I know that you may say we don't have enough data to say how long the seizure needs to be, but you know better than any of us. So what, what is your take on that? So no, no data about the duration of seizure. So no cutoff, I have no cutoff to define this. Uh, of course, it's clinical. Uh, we, are, we have the, the, our um, clinicians that define a, a severe a seizure or a classic seizure. So uh, when we perform MR scan, we usually have this kind of information, but not real uh, cutoff values. Uh, perfusion changes in the real uh, quick 
um, acquisition uh, uh, are um, not defined, uh, are not easy to define because in many studies and also in our experience, when we perform a mass scan in children uh, at, at the handle of the seizure, so in the very, very early, early period uh, after the seizure, we found hyperperfusion in some cases. And uh, I think that the reasons that may justify the hyperperfusion and the hyperperfusion needs to be found in the mechanism of seizures, because not, not all the seizures follow the same uh, clinical activity, uh, so, sorry, the same electroclinical uh, processes. And I think that the characteristic, the, the, the EEG findings also may justify these differences, but I have uh, no clear explanation that may justify an early hyperperfusion and a late hyperperfusion. What I have seen in my experience is that when you acquire after two hours, uh, you generally see the hyperperfusion. And I have never seen hyperperfusion, at least on a MAR perfusion scan. I have no experience on, on other techniques expect. Okay. And can I ask also, I can see also Sophie Adler, one of the colleagues who is actually spearheading the MELD project, which is a project of identifying uh, focal cortical dysplasia using different uh, uh, MRI sequencing. Sophie, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but do we use ASL as part of the MELD project? Have you found it useful or? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, oh, hi, Dominica. Thank you for a lovely hi. talk. And um, yeah, um, Dominica collaborates with us on the MELD project, which is great. Um, we don't um, acquire, we don't ask people to provide us with ASL because we did a survey of what scans were routinely collected for most patients and um, ASL wasn't consistently acquired by enough centers for it to meet the, the threshold for us to um, ask for it to be retrieved. Yes, it, yes, of course, the, 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 the ASL in our hospital, we use the sequences in all patients with epilepsy and also in other many other cases without epilepsy. So we, in the, in the last seven years, we, we, we collected also normative data uh, that we use in, uh, in a sort of a voxel based analysis to, to, to have an additional evaluation of perfusion changes uh, to localize the epileptogenic zone. And of course, uh, it, it, it is useful also to compare uh, with the results of the MELD uh, analysis on structural images. Uh, the problem is that in many cases we have uh, um, ASL uh, acquisition in the interrectal state of the epilepsy. So uh, we have to look for the hypoperfusion in some cases, for example, for focal cortical dysplasia, we usually um, wow. we, we, we look for the, hyper, the focal hypoperfusion rather than the hyperperfusion. And, uh, but I think uh, that it, it could be uh, an additional tool that uh, uh, can be uh, added to the structural analysis uh, to improve the detection of the epileptogenic zone, of course. Um, yeah, um, there's a question from a colleague asking how quickly the MRI changes resolve after prolonged focal status. I think you also mentioned that, but you can... Yes, uh, I, I think that you may observe the hyperperfusion at least for two days, so at least 48 hours. So um, you generally observe the resolution of the hyperperfusion after some days. When you, when you have a very prolonged seizure, uh, you, you may observe a longer abnormality on perfusion. And Michael and Shures, from your study, how quickly were the changes that you found in 15% of cases resolving? So they were, they were seen in the first 48 to 72 hours and usually resolved by the time they had yeah. a repeat scan between five to seven days. Is that yeah. correct, Mikey? Yeah, that's right. We, we weren't seeing them when, when, and, when we did them. And just one more thing to add. So these changes, they, they were only seen in hippocampus, uh, uh, not in the rest of cortex. And uh, these were only diffusion changes. Uh, because Das was kind of asking that question. So uh, bilateral kind of hippocampal changes uh, that kind of resolve uh, within the five to seven days. So the other question I had, Domenico, was uh, did you, I mean, one of the 
uh, issues we discussed kind of uh, in our uh, with our radiologists is when you see uh, some kind of um, uh, increased kind of signal in the white matter, and then we kind of uh, try and kind of debate whether that could be seizure related. Is is that something that you see commonly, or is there kind of data literature on that? Because we we I mean there is no way you yeah. can or can't say whether that could be seizure related. But I don't know if there is a, a better way of trying to answer that question. Sorry, uh, I missed something in your question. Are you so, asking me if so? Uh, thank you. See so if, if it's uh, any kind of uh, white, you know, increased signal in the white matter. Uh, on two weighted images. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on, on imaging, on, uh, on brain imaging, whether uh, there is any data to kind of, uh, that gives a bit more evidence to say they could be, I mean, they are more likely to be seizure related or it could be related to whatever is the pathology. No, oh, uh, um, generally the hyperperfusion, the, uh, sorry, the hyperintensity of the uh, subcortical white matter is an important finding that we look for detecting the uh, cortical lesion when, for example, the focal cortical dysplasia and uh, uh, of course, I, but I don't think it, it could be considered like a sort of seizure related uh, finding because in many cases we found these uh, abnormalities also when we acquired uh, the, the images uh, in the interictal phase. So uh, I think it's sort of, uh, mm, is, is, is related to the presence of lesion. And I, I don't think it's related to some sort of abnormalities of the white matter uh, related to the duration of seizure or uh, the same. So I think it, it should be considered at least on flare and situated images like uh, a sort of um, sign of lesion in that region of the brain. Okay, and because you've done so much research in, in this kind of, and reading in this area, uh, do you know if um, repeated, if, if if you scan this kind of patients kind of over time uh, with difficult epilepsy, do you see uh, increasing kind of abnormalities on imaging over time, which we don't tend to see, isn't it, for those with MR negative, for example, MR negative focal epilepsy, when you scan them over time over the years, the lesion doesn't necessarily become more obvious or kind of, uh, is there some data to suggest that might be the case? So you're asking me if the uh, hyper intensity of the lesion changes uh, at longitudinal analysis. So, right. Okay. Over, over many years, yeah. Over many years. No. Uh, 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 I think that the, some changes in the uh, intensity of the lesion uh, occurs mainly in the cortex. Uh, we, we have seen some cases uh, with hyperintensity. Probably I show also a case of the um, subcortical uh, glioneuronal tumor and uh, uh, the cortex, which is close to the lesion, uh, changes the hyperintensity at the a different moment of the follow up. So, and probably these changes could be considered like a sort of uh, like a sort of a seizure related changes, of course. Um, but I don't think that the lesion per se uh, needs to show any hyper intensity, a longer hyper intensity, uh, um, an higher hyper intensity uh, in, along the time. So I think it, it, I don't think it's the typical evolution. And uh, the, the changes in flare se in the sequence, the, the change of the flare signal, I think could be related to uh, the seizure related changes and not to the lesion. But the hyper intensity of the white matter probably is the sign of the lesion. Thank you. Um, although we have gone beyond time, probably I will ask a last question because you gave me the opportunity now with this question, Suresh. You spoke about uh, advanced myelination in the case of an epileptogenic focus, but I have to tell you, in our experience and in our epilepsy surgery meetings, it goes both ways sometimes. So we see when we have a focal epilepsy, we can see either advanced myelination or even actually um, uh, delayed myelination. So, and depending, of course, where the EG is coming from, sometimes we kind of you know, we kind of use it, use it um, towards the benefit of the of the EEG. If you see what I mean. So, do you have you seen at all? Because you looked at the literature literature recently, have you also seen cases where they say that actually you can have delayed myelination even when you have an epileptogenic focus, and it's not always advanced. Uh, 
so uh, I, I probably I need to, to, to specify this point. The advanced myelination is really frequent in very young infants, in the very early period of life, when the brain is not completely myelinated. So in that cases, we, uh, we saw on T2-weighted sequences on MR images, the low signal in the affected region, in the region where we have the lesion. Uh, in the later stages, after the second year of age, uh, we usually observe an abnormal signal of the white matter, in particular in patients with a, a relapsing seizure, with a complicated seizure. And uh, so the dysmyelination is a process that we frequently observe in a subject with a severe form of epilepsy. So, of course, it, it, both of them uh, should be considered. So uh, probably I have to add this concept in my presentation to clarify. No Snea, do you want to, uh, or Felice, do you want to make any comment about this? Am I right to say that we sometimes see the uh, opposite phenomenon in... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I was about to ask uh, Domenico, uh, fantastic talk. Um, so the dysmyelination is the cause where sometimes you see um, mesial temporal sclerosis um, and the anterior temporal white matter showing this kind of uh, hyperintensity. So do you think that sometimes we are not able to say whether it's an FCD1 or a secondary to seizure changes. Um, so do you think dysmyelination is the cause for that uh, signal changes? Yes, of course. The, the, the problem is that the dysmyelination in many cases is not focal because we see very large smooth abnormalities of the signal in the white matter. So probably this probably is the, 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 the neuroradiological point that we have to use to discriminate the different forms. So I think it's not so easy to, to, to discriminate a lesion uh, such as focal cortical dysplasia or a, the, the white matter abnormalities related to the focal cortical dysplasia, for example, in the temporal pole where the abnormalities is large, it's very large and it may involve all the subcortical white matter of the the uh, temporal pole uh, and uh, the, while the dysmyelination in patients with the severe um, epilepsy uh, frequently involve also both hemispheres but I, I think it, it, it is uh, something related to my experience probably you have a different data about that. So if I understood you correctly you're saying if we see the um, subtle white matter, the dirty white matter kind of appearance only unilaterally, it is yeah. more likely that it is related to dysplasia rather than... Yes, yes, of course. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, actually, I was looking out of interest, you know, the on the internet about incidental finding of hippocampal sclerosis. There's quite a few papers that um, and big cohorts that people have looked at. So it might be interesting. I put also uh, Mike has given the the um, citation he 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 suggested. And I put another one from seizure uh, just below this, but it is it is a bit. There is a few reports out there, so you can have all can all have a look. It can be incidental finding in some cases. Okay, so uh, Domenico it was an amazing talk once again. You never Thank disappoint you us. If you don't if you don't um, have any objections, you're going to be a regular. Uh, invitation for this meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so keep us keep us always uh, updated about your project there because we are very very interested. And I wish actually I'm I'm sure some of the neurology colleagues also agree. I wish we could also add ASL in our armistice for patients. Thank okay, you. great. Next next week we are going to have neurogenetics neuro metabolic meeting with interesting cases. So I would suggest all of you to to join as well. Domenico, once again, we are very, very grateful. And Felice also says he's very grateful. He had to leave. We have actually four or five Felices on the, but they're all clones of Felice. No one is the real Felice. One, one is enough. Yeah. We don't need three. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Domenico, many thanks. That, that was a really wonderful, wonderful summary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much you. for your invitation. Thank Amazing. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, Bye-bye. See you. See you. Thank you. See you.